I'll use the microphone because we're going over video, but normally my voice makes it all the way to the back, so I'll try and speak a little softer. Um, I have a list of things here they want me to, to say before we come in. So before we get to our, uh, our distinguished speaker here, Aaron Hoffman, I want to welcome everybody to the SFU Big Data Hub. Um, my name is Peter Chow White. I'm the director of the School of Communication. Uh, I was also one of the architects of the Big Data Initiative. Um, I was really, I was in sort of helping the VPR create this, uh, this incredible infrastructure we have now at SFU. I'm also co-chair of the Big Data Academic Advisory Committee um, with Dugan. Uh, and so we do a lot of work behind the scenes making sure that what it does is serve the entire university. And that's kind of one of the most important things about a place like this is once we got into big data, you think, okay, STEM is going to get a boost from this. Um, but a lot of the other departments, especially on the social sciences and, and more importantly, the humanities, they're not going to feel any of this infrastructure whatsoever. And that's something that we made sure that happened, that this facilitated the entire university. And so we're really, really pleased that this has happened. And someone like uh, Aaron Hoffman here today is a result of that, the, the really interesting research that he does. So I want to thank especially everybody with the BDI, from the tech staff to the organizers to, you know, the people that work behind the desk. Uh, Fred has done incredible leadership. You know, this would not have gotten off the ground, fellas in the business development here. You know, this would not have gotten off the ground without all the amazing, amazing teamwork that happened um, and and I really appreciate all the work that everybody's done um, I want to begin today by acknowledging that we are on uh, privilege to be working on the uh, unceded territory the Musqueam Squamish Tsleil-Waututh and uh, Stolo nation uh, lands uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to work here and to collaborate with one each other in very creative ways uh, I've also had the Sorry, I've got these notes here that are telling me what to say, but I think I've said half of it already. Uh, what, I will, what I will encourage people to do from this is to uh, use the hashtags, uh, S, hashtag SFU and hashtag data if they're tweeting things out or things on Instagram, stuff like that. So limiting, uh, getting to the topic at hand today, uh, limiting the attention countries receive from the foreign press is thought to reduce the incidence of deadly terrorist attract, attacks. But the question is, is how much? How much does this approach accomplish? Some countries stand to benefit more than others. Yet the data reveals that reducing press attention produces at best only minor reductions in the number of deadly foreign terrorist attacks countries experience. So it sounds like this approach may not be working particularly well. And this is why SFU is so pleased to introduce Aaron Hoffman as he delves into why pursuing this strategy may not provide as much security as governments expect. Aaron is one of the new faculty at SFU here, so welcome to SFU. We're very pleased to have you. Comes from Purdue University, and he specializes in political science, international politics. Uh, and uh, as I was talking to him earlier, his research really focuses on communication in, in matters of international security. I said to him, I go, my friend, I go, you sound like a communication scholar. So we're going to get you much more connected with communication, I think, and are, are really glad to have you here. Uh, specific projects include work on the coverage of terrorism by the mass media, public support for U.S. military operations, and trust in interstate conflict. Um, previously, he was at Purdue, where he created the, uh, the, the P2P Paper to P Publication Workshop. That's a tough one, Aaron. Thank you for putting that one in there. I appreciate that. I think someone was dropping a little something in there for me. A course designed to teach students how to get their research published. So like, students that are in the audience right now, sounds like Aaron's going to be a really, really good mentor to connect with. Uh, on behalf of SFU, please join me in welcoming Aaron Hoffman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful uh, introduction. And let me just get this up and perfect. And thank you, everyone, for, for coming. I see some colleagues. Thank you for coming. And some students, thank you for coming. And a friend, I appreciate everyone uh, coming by. And all the, all the people who I've met once or twice uh, and the people who are here new, I always uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, get the opportunity to meet uh, some new people uh, in and around SFU um, and uh, tell them about what I'm working on and hear what they are doing as well, and, and thank you especially to Tanya who spent a lot of time um, uh, dealing with me uh, to try to uh, arrange this, and that um, can't be pleasant. So uh, I appreciate that, thank you. Um, so today I'm gonna present a, a, a paper that was just recently published, uh, a co-authored paper with uh, two former students of mine, Crystal Shelton and Eric Clevin, and the paper is called Deadly Foreign Terrorism and the Rank Ordered Tournament for Press Attention. And uh, it kind of starts, uh, if you think about it, in, in, in France uh, in 2015, after the Islamic State uh, attacked Paris. And the president of France at the time, Francois Hollande, uh, uh, declared a state of emergency. And in that state of emergency, uh, uh, homes uh, were allowed to be searched without, uh, without warrants uh, or judicial oversight. 
um, uh, uh, people were deported. Uh, um, foreigners with possible ties to terrorist organizations were deported. Um, French citizens who had dual citizenship and were suspected of having ties uh, to terrorist organizations were threatened with, uh, with the loss of their, of their French citizenship. One of the things that, uh, that Hollande, though, did not do, even though he had the opportunity, uh, was interfere with the press. So the question that we want to ask is kind of a hypothetical one. Um, what if, what if Hollande or people like him um, decide that the reason why they are vulnerable to foreign terrorist attacks is because of the attention they receive from uh, international journalists like those at the Associated Press or the Jean's France Press or, or CBC or whatever. What if they decide that the real source of the vulnerability, the attraction for attacking uh, has to do with the opportunities for press attention or press coverage afforded by international journalists. Would it be possible, would it be possible for a leader like Hollande to make his country more, uh, make his country safer by diverting uh, press attention to other countries, to other issues, essentially denying uh, terrorists the opportunity for coverage by getting the press to think about other things? All right, now, so, <clears throat> Well, when I talk about terrorism, I mean uh, premedit premeditated, politically motivated violence perpetrated against non-combatant targets by subnational groups or clandestine agents. Uh, I just, I lay this definition out. It's a little bit controversial. We can certainly talk about it. Uh, one of the things that's not controversial about terrorism, though, is that uh, perpetrators of terrorism seem almost universally interested in getting uh, in getting media coverage. They're interested in opportunities for media coverage. And it's because of this, it's because of this that a lot of people think uh, that the thing to do when terrorists strike is to do what Pierre Trudeau did in the 1970s uh, with, with the FLQ in Quebec, which is to essentially uh, restrict what the, pr what the press can report. Uh, if you limit what the press is able to do, uh, you deny terrorists the thing that they really want, which is uh, the, 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 the kind of the publicity that's generated by their acts of violence. Margaret Thatcher called um, uh, the media the oxygen of terrorist activity. This is a, a really widespread sense that uh, the media really influences the way in which terrorists behave. But there's a kind of a new model, I think, that um, is emerging. Um, that we're really concerned about here, thinking about here. And it's not about um, restricting the press. It's about turning their attention to other things, distracting the press, um, getting them to think about things not about terrorism or about other countries, not about yours. Okay. Um, uh, and this is a kind of an interesting strategy. It's a new one. We're seeing a lot of it these days. I want to give you some examples. Um, so one thing that happened recently uh, during the, the Obama administration in the U.S. was that the Obama basically spent a lot of time trying to downplay the threat of Islamic terrorism. And particularly, uh, uh, I don't know why Fox News actually um, said this was a statement about al-Qaeda. It was actually a statement about, about the Islamic State. But his, his take on the Islamic State was, that, no big deal, guys, nothing, nothing to look at here. The, this is essentially the JV team, the junior varsity team, uh, putting on the Lakers uniforms and pretending they're Kobe Bryant. It's not really what's going on. We can think about something else. We don't have to spend so much time worrying about what's going on in Iraq and Syria. Don't pay attention. ISIS is unimportant. That's one way to get the press to uh, change its, its focus. Option two is be really, really, really good at Twitter. Um, this is, uh, I mean, Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump is really blazing a trail here. Uh, he is a master um, at this. Um, he's really good at getting the press to focus on the things that he tweets, um, the outrageous things, the whatever, all the things that he tweets. I mean, you know, the, 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 the Trump Twitter beat is literally part of the media now. Uh, and while he's tweeting things out at 5 o'clock in the morning or 4 o'clock in the morning, whenever he, he does it, um, uh, the media focuses on what he says on Twitter rather than what his administration is doing. And a lot of the things that his administration are doing are, are controversial and would be stories to, to cover. But instead, we want to see him uh, scream at North Korea that he's going to nuke them faster than they're going to nuke us. 
This one uh, is clearly part of the strategy. It's the kind of the sketchier side of the strategy, but uh, there's clearly precedent for it. And that is you can get the press to think about other things by creating fake news. Um, uh, the Iranian regime, for example, has been, um, has been accused of actually fomenting terrorism in other parts of the world in an effort to get the world to stop paying attention to its own nuclear, uh, its own nuclear ambitions. Uh, the Russians uh, it created um, uh, rumors in the 1980s that the, that the U.S. government was responsible for developing the AIDS virus and then disseminating it around, uh, infecting people around the world. That took a long time for people to kind of track down and, uh, and eradicate. So fake news is a way of getting the press to really think about things that are not necessarily what, uh, what terrorists are hoping uh, the press will think about. Whatever you think about these, the value of these strategies, actually every single one of the ones that I just listed has been criticized for one reason or another. Um, uh, whatever you think about them, they actually have one really, really important advantage. And that is they get democratic governments out of the business or potentially get democratic governments out of the business of trying to deal with the publicity threat uh, of terrorism by clamping down on the media, by undercutting fundamental democratic freedom. This is one of the kind of the big, this is kind of one of the big problems that, that, uh, that we deal with when it comes to terrorism crises and the threat of terrorism. And that is that one of the, a lot of the really important um, defensive measures that governments have at their disposal um, trade democratic liberties, the things that you and I enjoy, our ability to speak freely, to gather in the places we want to gather, for the press to publish what the press wants to publish, to trade those things for security. Um, and it's a, it's a very difficult decision uh, to try to get into. Uh, it's a very difficult decision to try to avoid. Um, and it's clearly one that, that bothers everybody, even, though, even the governments that do it. Distracting the press is potentially a way in which you can deal with the, uh, the, the desires of, of perpetrators of terrorism to want uh, publicity without necessarily undercutting basic democratic freedoms. Big disadvantage, no idea if it works. Uh, just you know, this is just people doing stuff, you know? This is Trump doing Trump and seeing if it works. And maybe it does and, and maybe it doesn't. Um, so before, you know, any government decides to really invest in this strategy as a long-term way of dealing with terrorism, uh, they might like to know whether it's gonna be worth their time and energy. Uh, and so uh, this is really where, what our contribution is about, trying to get a sense of, some idea of, whether this strategy works. And the answer I'm going to give you is one that, that Peter uh, mentioned a little bit, which is that um, we think that it's possible to identify small benefits uh, of this strategy. It's, it's possible to um, reduce the number of attacks that, uh, that countries suffer by, by changing the amount of attention foreign press uh, pay to them. But the benefits are, sm the benefits are small, and they're unevenly distributed. In fact, some, some governments would be better off not trying the strategy at all. They might be worse off in the long run, actually, if they reduce press attention rather than just leaving themselves where they are. Others will actually get these, these benefits, but there are certainly situations in which there's going to be a counterproductive uh, consequence to reducing press attention. And I'm going to explain, explain why this is. So how do, we, how do we answer this question? How do we arrive um, at this, uh, this answer? Does it work? That's, that's this part of the talk. Um, here was our basic strategy. The basic strategy we had was uh, to try to develop a statistical model that, that uh, showed the relationship between the, uh, the amount of foreign press attention that countries received and the, and the number of deadly foreign attacks that they experienced. Um, and then kind of to test that model against a body of evidence, to validate it, if you will, and then once we had those estimates to be able to, and, that, and the results of that research, to be able to simulate with those results, simulate what would happen if the countries that we are seeing in the world had less press attention than they actually have now. So what would happen if, as this is an example I'll give you later, the United States is the, is the country in the world that gets covered the most by the press. What would happen if, hypothetically, the, uh, the U.S. could reduce the amount of attention it received from foreign, from foreign journalists? How would that affect the number of attacks it suffered annually. That's basically the kind of question that we're doing, and that's the strategy that we're using to answer this question. We did this in kind of four steps. 
um, number one, the big step and the one that I'm going to spend the most time on, was we, we thought a lot about the relationship between foreign press attention and the incidence of deadly foreign terrorism. How does that relationship work out? How, do, how does it work that, that, that uh, incidents of terrorism follow uh, the, uh, the distribution of attention from journalists around the world? Um, we wanted to make sure uh, and I know there are a bunch of social scientists uh, in the audience here, but, uh, so we wanted to make sure that, our, that we weren't mistaking uh, attacks that, uh, that were influenced by the media for the attacks that were being, sorry, we didn't want to make the mistake of, of, of attributing some attacks to pre press attention that were being, uh, that were responsible for, that were being caused by something else, so we thought about what the, alternative, the alternatives could be. Um, we tested all of these ideas about the relationship, again, on a, on a body of data, and then we, we went through this simulation. So step one, the theoretical model. All right, so this is where things are going to get weird. Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about the Olympics because, I mean, duh, right? Um, why did we spend a lot of time thinking about the Olympics? Um, we, we drew an analogy between the effort to gain press attention uh, by any publicity seekers and the effort to kind of win medals at the Olympics because we think they actually have a lot of similarities. Um, in economics, uh, Olympic competitions are known as um, rank-ordered tournaments. That's where the title of the paper comes from. Uh, and they're called rank-ordered tournaments because the prizes that you get in the Olympics um, vary in terms of their desirability. Best to get a gold medal, second best to get a silver, third best to get a bronze, way better to get a bronze than nothing at all. Okay, so the, uh, the awards are ranked in terms of their quality, and they're finite. Uh, and it turns out there's a lot of other uh, similarities between Olympic competition and the effort to go to get publicity. So in this analogy, we thought of countries like uh, Olympic arenas where competitions take place. We think of journalists as like the judges that, that, uh, that, that examine and evaluate the bids for publicity that terrorist organizations and other publicity seekers make, uh, make in front of them. They're the ones that decide whether you win the competition or not, whether you get any publicity or not, what, what rank uh, what, what quality of publicity do you get? They're the, they're the key pieces of this, of this puzzle. The press coverage that you win are like the medals that are awarded during Olympic competition. Okay, so there's a finite number of them and they vary in their desirability. So just think about this, for example. You commit a terrorist attack, it could get covered in a middle page of the Chronicle Herald, which is published in Halifax, and I'm sure very few people in this room read. Um, if that happens, well, again, that's better than no coverage at all, but very few people are going to see it. It's not going to be an attack that has a wide, uh, uh, has wide effect, a wide impact on the public, because it's kind of buried. It would be better to have your, uh, your attack published on the front page of the Globe and Mail. That's much more of a national paper, much larger, larger readership. And if you really want to go, go big, you might want to get your attack published on the front page of the New York Times. It's got one of the largest circulations in North America. Now, some of you are probably already saying, okay, now wait a second. There are so many uh, media outlets, way more media outlets out there, way more opportunities for publicity than there are medals in the, in the Olympics. And that's true. You, know, you, could get, you could get coverage on the Huffington Post or in the CBC. There are a lot more opportunities for, for publicity than there are medals in the Olympics. And, and the, the uh, analogy is not always perfect every time. The thing that really matters, though, I think, and the thing that we decided really matters, was not that there were more opportunities for publicity than there are medals in the Olympics, but this point that I made at the beginning. There are still a finite number of opportunities for publicity. There are lots of groups that do things and get no publicity at all. Um, uh, and there is at least a, a rough, in, a, in rough terms, it's possible to rank the quality of publicity uh, that people get. Uh, it's much better to be on the uh, above the fold on the on the Huffington Post, right? The first part where the where the, where the screen loads, then below the fold when you've got to squ scroll all the way down. Um, uh, so there's th this quality part ma makes a big makes a, a big difference. Uh, it also matters that there are going to be lots and lots of disappointed contestants, lots of lots of people in groups that are trying to get publicity and fail, or that get publicity that they're really dissatisfied with, right? This is the the middle of the Chronicle Herald kind of publicity. <clears throat> the finite, num the finite um, character of the awards, of the publicity awards that are available, um, helps stimulate competition for press attention. Everybody wants press attention, but not everybody can get it, so they got to work for it. It's not just something that gets bestowed upon them. Okay. 
And because they know that everybody is working hard for it, everyone else has to work equally hard or harder to try to win the awards. Okay, so there's a lot of effort that gets put into, uh, into it, and that effort, can be, that effort can be for nothing, right? So you can, you can spend all your time trying to get publicity, and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, something strange happens, vol you know, a volcano erupts, and no one cares about what you did yesterday. So all that effort can be for naught. Just like in the Olympics, the skill, the skill levels of the contestants vary. Right? In bobsled, the Canadians are great, the Americans are great, right? The, the Jamaican bobsled team, not so great, especially in the beginning. Um, so everyone comes with different abilities uh, to be able to influence the press to uh, pay attention to them. So just to think about this in the context of terrorist organizations, think about the problem that Jamaat Islamiyah has. This is a pretty tough group as, as groups go. They've been around for a long time. Terrorist organizations like restaurants don't last that long usually. So to be around for a couple of years is a big deal. Uh, Jamaat Islamiyah is definitely a tough organization. But any time they think about going outside of the Philippines to attack, they've got to worry that ISIS is going to do the same thing. And ISIS is just way better, at least over the last couple of years, is just way better than Jamaat Islamiyah at getting headlines. Right? It would be very easy for Jamaat Islamiyah to get knocked off the front page or to get knocked out of coverage entirely because of something outrageous that ISIS does. Okay. Now, terrorist organizations in general are pretty good at getting, uh, at getting publicity. I mean, killing people is newsworthy, you know, unfortunately. Uh, but they're not the, only, uh, the, not the only organizations out there that are good at getting publicity, not the only people out there that are, getting, uh, that are good at getting publicity. They may not even be the best. I mean, just think about the problem that, that poor uh, Jamal Islamiyah and ISIS have to have if Kim Kardashian decides to, to try to break the internet again. I mean, she's tough. I mean, it's pretty hard to kind of knock her out of the front pages. Anytime she kind of steps up to the plate, she's going to get, she's going to get a lot of press. And poor Kim Kardashian has to deal with this guy, right? He's the best of them all. Um, uh, when he decides that he wants publicity, he just gets it. Uh, remember, there's, a, there's finite space for publicity. And so when these two uh, decide today's the day, that's kind of the way it is. So there's a lot of tough competition out there. Um, uh, terrorist organizations are not just in a position where they just snap their fingers and they, want, they wind up onto the front pages of the Times. They have a lot of competition for that, and, it's, and it can be daunting. It can, it can be daunting to realize that you have to go up against um, skilled publicity hounds like these two, and there are more than just them. Okay, so how do you win this game? How do you win this tournament? How do you get the publicity that you're out there searching for? Um, the rules are not that, are not, the rules for winning are not that complicated and they're pretty well known. The first thing is, is you've got to do your best. You can't just come with some lame publicity effort. It's got to be good. Because uh, remember, everybody else is trying hard too. In fact, you probably have to outdo the competition, especially if you want the gold medal of publicity. Um, you, really have to, you really have to work hard at it. Number two, uh, you have to make those publicity bids in the most important arenas. Okay? Um, the, the press prioritizes events and information and publicity bids um, from some places way more than others. Let me give you an example here. I don't, can you see this? This is, a, this is a, a, a graph that we did of just 16 countries just to kind of give people a sense of what press attention around the world looked like. I'm not going to talk right now about how we generated these numbers. Really, the most important thing to recognize is that this laser print uh, pointer doesn't work. Um, but um, that basically Laos, uh, Iceland, and Uruguay they are pretty low uh, on the totem pole uh, in terms of getting press attention. They're not prioritized by the press. The press doesn't spend a lot of time reporting on those places. Okay? You commit a, a really bad act or a notorious act in one of those places, it, it, might, it might just get ignored. Right? It, it might get publicity, but it might get ignored. Now, you do something really outlandish in France or China or Russia or the United States, press really cares about that. They really care about reporting on those places. The level of attention that they spend to those, to those countries is enormous compared to what they, they pay to those countries at the top. Um, uh, you can really make a splash by doing something crazy in, in these countries that get the most press attention. The problem is, is that everybody knows that, and all the really, really tough publicity hounds are also competing in France, China, and the United States, not in Laos and Iceland, right? Kim Kardashian doesn't try to break the, the internet in Iceland. She goes to the United States to do that. Um, and so, again, that's where the competition is really the toughest. It's really, really hard to win in, that, in those arenas. Okay? So this is kind of all this is leading us to expect that there's a nonlinear relationship between uh, publicity and the, between the, the press attention 
and the incidence of, of deadly foreign terrorism. Um, so just to kind of go through this kind of briefly, so on the left side here where it says 0 0.05, that's where Burundi is, right? 0.25 is about where Laos is. Uh, 0.95, that's over where the United States is. Okay, so when you're starting out over here on the left side of this graph, um, there are kind of big and rapid advantages to um, increases in press attention. As press attention goes up, the interest that the groups have in, in attacking go up kind of rapidly. But as you move uh, to the right, as you move towards these more um, uh, in, uh, places that are covered more heavily, um, there's a kind of a drag there's a, the, on, on, the, on the interest in, um, in, 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 uh, in attacking. And the reason is, is that as you move this way, the competitions get harder and harder to win. So there's a discouragement effect that's going on, right? This is the kind of, this is the Kim Kardashian effect. Um, groups are starting to realize, hey, wait a second, we really just can't, uh, play in this arena. The people here are just too good. We're not going to get uh, to get noticed. And in fact, it's so severe that, and I just drew this line at two, just so you could see what happens, that literally at some point there's an inflection and the, 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 rate, uh, the, the, the rate at which um, uh, attacks occur decline. Actually, they start to drop down uh, ultimately below this, this, this uh, two number. Um, this is again just to kind of give you the sense that that there's a that there's a breaking point at which uh, the discouragement effect outweighs the encouragement effect that you get from uh, from press attention. Okay. <clears throat> then we had to identify controls. So I'm going to blow through this pretty fast. Uh, we, I can talk about this in the Q and A, but just to kind of give you a sense what else is in the model, we want to try to figure out what else could it be other than pre the press that could account for the distribution of attacks around the world. So number one, we thought. U.S. allies get hit a lot. Uh, there's a lot of research on this. If you're an ally of the United States, you're more likely to be uh, subject to an international attack. Uh, countries that are involved in international rivalries, think of like India and Pakistan, uh, they have a lot, of, there's a lot of terrorism inside those rivalries back and forth between them. Countries that are involved in foreign interventions, like Russia and Syria or something like that. When you're involved in, when you're intervening in the civil war of another country, that often provokes a lot of terrorism against you. Relatedly, countries that are involved in foreign policy crises um, uh, often can be subject, uh, can often find increased level of, of attacks against them. Maybe not so surprisingly, the world's strongest military powers are attacked more often. Countries that have a lot more terrorist organizations operating inside them uh, can be subject to more foreign attacks uh, than others. And last but not least, the kind of government that you have uh, is often a predictor of terrorism. It's a lot easier to, uh, to, to fly into a Canada, an open society, and commit a dastardly act than it is to penetrate a police state like North Korea. Right? So the, the freer that you are, the more open that you are, the more you allow uh, people to associate freely, uh, the more risk you have for, for terrorist activity. Okay. <clears throat> so our statistical test. I should say these are tests. I'll be brief here. So we, we just to kind of focus on the on the, the barest bones of what we did, we used a database of um, international terrorist attacks called Iterate, um, uh, which is which is developed uh, has, I think data since the 1970s uh, to today uh, that talks about again where attacks are that, that where the perpetrators cross an international boundary. Uh, we're trying to predict where those attacks happen in the world. Where do they happen in the world? And what we did was the main kind of predictor we were using was press attention, which we measured with a 10 million case database of reports that are issued by, by the um, wire service Agence France Press. It's like the French uh, counterpart to um, AP. Uh, and we used those sorted by country to try to see if we could find a relationship. This is an ugly table. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this ugly table. I'd be happy to talk about that more. But there are just kind of two things I want to draw your attention to. The first is that um, all of the coefficients for, for foreign press attention are significant. And all of the coefficients for foreign press attention squared, that's how we were modeling this nonlinear effect, uh, are also significant. The, the ones for foreign press attention are positive, and the ones for foreign press attention are negative, and no one in this room should know what that means, so I'll show you. It means this. Um, <clears throat> this is what the relationship is. This is what our statistical analysis suggests the relationship is. The actual relationship is between foreign press attention and the incidence of deadly 
foreign terrorist attacks. So just like we hypothesized, where there's this kind of curvilinear relationship, at some point, uh, at some point the uh, countries that have more press attention start to experience fewer attacks than ones that have less. Okay. Oops. Okay. All right. So what does this mean? All right. So we used the, those, those, those statistical estimates to try to basically make some forecasts. And we asked ourselves, okay, well, what would happen in the best case scenario? Imagine you're the United States and you could wave your magic wand and poof, turn yourself into the press equivalent of Burundi, the least covered country in the world. How many fewer attacks, deadly attacks, could you expect to experience? And the answer is about one every two years. We have no idea how the United States would ever manage to pull this off, by the way. I have no idea how the U.S. would turn itself into the press equivalent of Burundi. That's for someone else to figure out. We're just waving the magic wand here. So you do that, the U.S. becomes Burundi in terms of the amount of attention the media pays to it. You save about one, one deadly attack every, 12, every two years. That's about, in, in, in human life, that's about 12 people every two years. Uh, that one attack might kill about 12 people. So the U.S. government would probably save the, the lives of about 12 Americans uh, every, every two years. That's the best case scenario. No, no, by best case scenario, I mean no country in our analysis can do better than the U.S., if the U.S. were to become Burundi. So if, if the, the number two country in the world is China, if they were to become Burundi, they would not do better than this, and so on down the line. Okay. So let's say we tried something that was a little bit more realistic. Although, again, I have to say I don't know how we would do this, but we thought 20 per, a 20% reduction in press attention was more realistic. It was doable. I don't know how, but we thought that sounded like a, a doable enough number. Okay. Here things get weird uh, again. So if the United States, France, China, Russia, Indonesia, if they were to reduce their foreign press attention by 20%, we think there's a good reason to expect that they will experience more attacks, not fewer. And the reason is, the reason is, is that reducing press attention by 20% um, just undercuts that discouragement effect enough that all of a sudden, a lot of those um, discouraged terrorist organizations who thought, ah, we would never get, be able to get publicity there, now they suddenly think, okay, we have a shot. That competition's not quite as tough as it used to be. Right? The, the, value of, the value of doing something dastardly in a place like the United States with only 20% of the press attention that it's getting from today is not as high. Now, if you're Egypt, Denmark, Nigeria, Chile, uh, Ukraine, this strategy might work better. Right? They're already in the middle. They're already in the middle of the range. Taking 20% away from the kind of press attention that they currently get might, might, make, some big, might make some big differences. Right? Might, might actually reduce the incidence of terrorism in a significant way, um, or measurable way, I should put that. In terms of, terms of kind of casualties, you're always worried about not just you know, property damage, but are people getting killed? Um, if you did a 20% reduction in press attention in, those, in the US, China, France, all, you really would, you would see almost no difference in the number of people that were dying every year. Um, it's just basically flat. Um, Chile gets a, gets a reasonably big uh, decrease, about 20 people. Um, that's something. That's definitely something. It's not huge, but it's something. So what are, what, are we, what are we drawing our conclusions about from this? So I guess the big question is, should governments uh, invest on influencing the, the level of attention that, um, uh, that the foreign media pays to them? And our answer is a resounding uh, maybe. Um, and uh, basically it's maybe, there's a lot of really things that are going on here. The number, number one thing is that it really depends on how much press attention you're already getting. How much press attention you think you can actually under or shift, and whether you think the, the benefits are, are worth the investments. Right? So if you're the United States and you think you can only do a 20 to 25 percent reduction, you might be better off just not doing it. 
Um, if you're Egypt, if you're Chile, well, that's a different story. They are in the middle of the range for them. Those the kind of the, the, the contextual effects of de decreases are variable. Um, so that's number one. Number two, um, why are they so variable, or why are they a better question? Why are these so? Why are these um, uh, effects kind of so small? The basic answer is is that is that international terrorism is pretty rare. Uh, there's just not a lot of international terrorism to discourage. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a reg in an average year, most countries experience none, no international terrorism at all. Um, some will experience more, but because of that, there's just not a lot. There's just not a lot to do. Um, so all of these effects are going to be small. Last but not least, um, um, because these because changing press attention is probably difficult, and because the effects are small. In the end, I have to say, I think that we, were, we started out maybe hopeful that this was a way that governments could avoid this kind of liberty security trade-off trap. But by the end, I think we were less, less convinced. Um, there's just not, I mean, again, there's something here. Some people may decide it's enough. It doesn't feel like a lot to me and my co-authors. Uh, and so I think we're not necessarily in a situation right now where this is a strategy that's going to deal with those fundamental problems that, that, gov that democratic governments have. Uh, in dealing with terrorism over the long term. And with that, I will take questions. Nice, Aaron. Thank you very much for that really uh, intriguing and thought-provoking uh, um, talk. Um, I really like and interested at this sort of uh, the three cohorts that came out of that. I didn't realize as you were going through the first part with the graphs that, you know, the first part with the uh, countries that were highest in terms of uh, foreign press coverage, yep would get the least amount of effect compared to the ones in the middle. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, folks, I'd like to turn it over to the audience and uh, just pass the mic. Thanks, Aaron. It's great. Um, I was wondering if you, you know, looked at different sort of uh, nonlinear relationships, because here's an al alternative explanation that maybe there's just a diminishing returns. Um, it's not that uh, at the highest levels in the U.S., it's not that the edge people move away from attacks because of the competition. It's just there's a diminishing returns about, because you use the curvilinear model that it gets modeled as such. The, so it's a misspecified model. If you used a, a different nonlinear relationship, which was just diminishing returns, you might have found that instead. So it's only if you tried that and compared the model fits, that type of thing. We didn't try, uh, thanks, that, that's a good question. We didn't try other nonlinear uh, specifications. We, we tried a lot of different specifications, but we, we mainly compared them to uh, the principal alternative we thought was uh, which a linear specification. And, and the, this nonlinear uh, specification um, uh, worked, it fit, fit the data better, so we were more confident that this was the right one. I would say that, um, uh, um, you know, I, as, a, uh, as, a, as a publicist for my own work, I, I love the idea that there's this kind of, um, bat, that there, there could be um, uh, a counterproductive effort effects of, of, this, of this kind of, um, and so, but, but, I, but we also, I think, say, and I should probably have said more clearly, that it's, it's possible that it's not. Uh, I mean, just to kind of, if you go back to the, that, um, this graph, uh, like the shaded area are, is, the, are, is the error range. And the error range, as you know, is pretty wide here. And so um, that dark line could really be anywhere in that, in, that, in that shaded range. And so it might not be the case that you see this, that you see the, the kind of um, uh, uh, the problematic part that we're seeing. It may, that may not actually happen. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that we, we, that's possible even in this model. But I guess the, a bigger point would be that no matter, even if it's not the case that it can be counterproductive, um, there's, a, it, there's not really a lot of evidence that after a certain point, it makes much difference. Thanks, Aaron. Really interesting. So strange to think about like the the rationality of, uh, of terrorist organizations competing. But uh, uh, that aside, um, uh, I, found it I found it interesting, but I, I wonder if you actually have the right dependent variable in some ways, which is you're measuring successful attacks rather than attempted attacks. And it seems to me your entire theory is built around the idea of organizations attempting rather than being successful. Now, is there any relationship between attempts and successes? I mean, is it, are they correlated with one another? Because it also seems to me that 
as more and more attacks happen, there's also internal resources, you know, oppressing uh, and capturing terrorism uh, and limiting it is expensive. Uh, but the more that it happens, the more likely it would seem that states are going to invest resources in that. Uh, and if you, I wonder if you can get at that by the difference between attempting versus versus uh, actual success. So, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, in this in this data set that that we did not collect of of uh, terrorist attacks of, of international terrorist attacks, there are um, threats rather than just. Um, actualized attacks. So the way in which we, we certainly focused on what you're saying are um, successful attacks is that these, we really looked at those attacks in which, in which perpetrators killed other people. Uh, and so in that sense, I think you're right on the money uh, with, with this, that, that maybe we should be thinking about um, just the, whole, the full range of attacks or, just, or even uh, attempts. It's hard to get at that full range. Um, um, we could get at the, uh, we could get at the um, just all attacks, so for example, those which, which perpetrators commit uh, an act of violence without killing anybody, and see what the relationship there is. And we did do that, but right now I honestly do not remember what we found. I think, I think it's consistent, but I, I, can't, I can't remember at this, at this moment. I should, I should know that. Um, um, but more importantly, I would say that I think this dependent variable is right for the, for the, for the reason that um, the logic of the, of the theory is that um, the pressure to get publicity should encourage groups to, out, to try to outdo each other. And so we should be seeing more of these more violent, uh, more, uh, more deadly attacks. And so it really should be something about the, um, uh, the, the lethality of, of terrorist violence. Having said that, I, I agree um, that, that a, better, a better overall measure would be something that kind of looked at all of those times when groups thought about it and decided not to. And I'm not sure how to get at that totally, but yeah. So um, thank you for the presentation. Yeah. It was fascinating. So one of the things I'm curious about, obviously your research is focused on international press coverage, and this is through traditional media. And with the media landscape and consumer media consumption trends are changing to be more uh, segmented, more fragmented in social media structures. Did your team look at or, or attempt to look at any um, social media or alternative media sources to see if potentially they're able to be more successful reaching the targets that they're actually looking to influence, which is a much more segmented audience than necessarily a mass uh, media consumption audience? We didn't. Um, that's definitely a limitation of our study. I would, I would, um, I would not be so stupid uh, as to say in a public f uh, forum that um, is being recorded that those forum that those situations don't matter. Um, I'll say that privately. Um, but uh, no, the, the the only kind of the, I think the one defense we have uh, from, from on that is just the following, which is that. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, there's a lot more of the of segmentation uh, of the media. People are, are going to niche uh, uh, media to get the news that they want, that appeals to them in whatever way, much more than they did uh, even 10 years ago. Um, but, I th but I think the evidence, at least the evidence from the United States, is that um, the, the, the news reports that are produced by traditional news organizations are still the ones that people are sharing the most. So yeah, you know, um, you know, you're going to get stuff that some guy filmed on the corner and and just gets shared around by 50 people or whatever it is, and and you'll get small news organizations that that uh, maybe I've never heard of that are being shared around, but the New York Times is still a beast in this space, whether it's social media, uh, just internet searches, uh, or the traditional print media, and that's, that's that's true. I would I would hazard I would think for USA Today, the Wall Street Journal. Um, uh, they're still really important uh, in that. So I, I feel like we're still, we haven't yet gotten to the point where those traditional news outlets uh, are not still defining the things that we're talking about uh, in the public square. I think after this we have time for maybe one more question after this. 
I was going to ask where does Canada fit into this? You didn't show it specifically in any of your charts. Yeah. And I've noticed that the, uh, the Canadian government is very quiet in comparison to the US. Yeah, so. I, I did this work before I knew I was coming here. Uh, so <laughs> so I, I don't actually have Canada listed um, in, in the charts that I have, so I can tell you exactly where they are on this. Uh, I mean, certainly it's the case that, um, uh, that Canada is subject to many, many fewer international attacks than, uh, than the United States or probably even France and Germany, um, but exactly where they fit in, the, in, the, in the, you know, that span of, of press attention, I really I can't say. I, I'm guessing they're more in that kind of Egypt um, uh, zone, kind of in the middle uh, of the pack, which, which, mean, which would mean that if they could somehow reduce the press attention that they got, there would be some benefit, but that's a guess. Yeah. Do we have one more? Anybody else? Great. Oh, oh I, was going, I was going twice on that one. It just about came in. Out of boy, Abby. Uh, thanks so much for uh, detailing your study here. Um, moving away from the theoretical aspect of your uh, study here, uh, my question is more data focused. Um, so given the complexity of this model, uh, it's guaranteed that there's tons of data that went into informing it. What were some of the challenges that you and your team faced in scraping that data that informed this model, essentially? Um, you know, the, the biggest challenge, that there's not a, there was not a lot of uh, novel data generation on our part. Uh, all of these, all of the information that we used is available through uh, kind of public or academic sources. Um, we, we developed a measure of press attention from, a, from an existing data set, so that, that's something that we've added to that um, literature. So I would say that the biggest um, problem that we had is, is in what uh, Hadley Wickham calls wrangling the data, basically getting all of this, this nonsense, all this information into a, uh, a space that we could actually um, you know, use to make sense of it all. Uh, that's where all of the effort has taken, and, and that effort has taken years. Um, and, uh, you know, it's taken years because, um, you know, for stupid reasons, this group uses one numbering system to identify countries. This group uses a different one. Why do they use a different one? Just to be jerks, I guess. I don't know. Um, you know, and so you have to figure out how to do it. And then, of course, there are the, you know, countries change names. And then when they change names, how do you merge them? It's not so simple. So you've got to go through. I mean, with the number of times, that, the number of conversations I've had about North and South Yemen is just unbelievable. Uh, that place could really, from my research perspective, just go away, and I'd be much happier. We'd be solve a lot of problems in wrangling the data. But yes, so they, it's been a, it's been that that's the biggest challenge. Excellent. On that note, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Aaron Hoffman. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, please join us outside. There's refreshments. Come mingle, network, chat. Um, come hang out, please. <laughs>